Hi, everyone, and welcome to our final book talk of 2022, Educating for the Anthropocene, Schooling and Activism in the Face of Soul Violence. A reminder that chat is disabled for attendees, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to enter them into the Q&A feature below. I would like to begin by briefly introducing Monica Higgins, the Kathleen McCartney Professor of Education Leadership at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where her research and teaching focus on the areas of leadership development and organizational change. Monica, you can take it from here. Great, welcome everybody. It's so wonderful to have you here. And in particular, it's wonderful to have Peter Satoris who will be talking about educating for the Anthropocene uh, his latest book. And um, just to say briefly, Peter and I um, actually do share a love of the out of doors and the environment and also the big green, otherwise known as Dartmouth, we have to say. Um, and Peter and I started talking about the work that he uh, is up to and now has, you know, obviously put into a book a long, long time ago um, when he was thinking about scaling interventions for greater social impact as they have to do with the environment and different cultural contexts and different country contexts. And now it's wonderful, Peter, to see this work come so, so far um, and really looking forward to the book, which by the way, for those of you who are curious, it is beautifully written. And so I just, I, I love that as in addition to being um, a scholar and a researcher, he's an excellent writer. So. Peter Satoris is an assistant professor in education at the University of York and the author of Monographs, Visions of Development, published by Oxford University Press in 2016, as well as Educating for the Anthropocene, which is a topic of today that's been published by the MIT Press just this year, 2022. His current research focuses on imagination of alternative futures, cultures of degrowth, and activist pedagogies. Peter, it's wonderful to have you and we really look forward to this book talk. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. I uh, really appreciate that, that generous uh, introduction. I'm going to jump right into it because we've got right. quite a lot to get through and I, I want to make sure that, um, that we have time for questions as, as well. So uh, please uh, do do um, write those down into the Q&A feature uh, if you have any, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to them. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to start with these, these quotes, you know, that I'm not going to really um, say anything specific about. These are, these are just some of the kind of framing quotes of the book that I think uh, just sort of give you a little bit of a sense of a little bit of a feel for this, for this project, uh, which is, you know, somewhere, somewhere between hope and despair, uh, you, could, you could say. Um, and I think they will they will make much more sense, you know, as we as we go through. And I think you'll you'll get a bit more sense about what I mean by by each of these, or what I've sort of chosen to include each of these each of these perspectives. Um, but I would actually like to start with um, that first book that came out six years ago, which um, a lot of people who are familiar with that work uh, were quite surprised, you know, that I sort of ended up writing my my next book on on something called Educating for the Anthropocene. They they seemed like they're very different and and very sort of disconnected. But um, in, in my mind, they are actually very much the same project. You know, it's basically a continuation of sort of when where one project stopped, the other one began. And so I'd like to spend just a few minutes on that on that first book, uh, because I think it's it's actually the best way to introduce what this new book is, is about and the, the argument um, that it is it is trying to say. So this this book, Visions of Development, uh, which which came out six years ago was looking at um, at India in the sort of post-colonial period after India got um, independence from, from Britain, 1947. Uh, and it was looking at uh, development during, during the last sort of first three, four decades of, of India's independence. Uh, the interesting thing about India is that it is the only former British colony that has been pretty much persistently, consistently a democracy. Uh, most other former colonies um, have had long periods of dictatorships, um, you know, military rule and, and so on. And what we know from uh, theories in political science is that if you have a democratic um, country, you know, if you have a democratic system, what tends to happen over time uh, is that people will elect leaders that actually uh, tends to favor um, so-called prosperity, progress, development, whatever whatever we call it. But in India, actually, what happened during those decades was that per capita, the country was getting poorer and poorer. 
And um, I was interested in, in, in why that was, why on the one hand we have this, this democratic country, on the other hand, uh, we've got, uh, you know, basically increasing poverty. Um, and I was interested in looking at this through the prism of film, of, of all things, uh, because I discovered this archive of uh, literally thousands and thousands of short documentary films that were made by an organization called Films Division of India, uh, which was set up uh, by the independent government to basically promote this vision of the future that it was it was trying to convince everybody else in the country um, to to support. And just to give you um, a taste for uh, what those films looked like, I am going to um, play just a couple of minutes, uh, just a short clip of um, one such film called um, Our Industrial Age. Oops. Are you able to? Oh. oh, there we go. Okay. India has been living in villages for centuries. Villages which were once more or less self-sufficient economic units. The village had its potter, its blacksmith, its carpenter, its tanner and its oil press. There were simple devices for crushing sugarcane and making gold. And the village handloom produced the cloth that was needed. But gradually, as population increased, big cities grew up. They gave an impetus to trade and commerce. This, in turn, led to a rise in the living standards of our people. And the demand for the products of the industrial age also increased. ever-increasing needs of the people, the production of goods on a mass scale was necessary. For instance, millions of yards of cloth were needed at prices low enough for the average budget. Fans, radios and other things of daily use came within the reach of many. But this was not enough. Production had to be increased many fold. And therefore, our country launched the first five-year plan committed to increase our agricultural and industrial wealth. To achieve this, the irrigation of thousands of acres of arid lands was necessary. The water would also help to turn the turbines to produce more electric power. The construction of dams in different parts of the country received special emphasis under the plan, an inspiring effort to utilize the tremendous water wealth of our subcontinent. Industries like the fertilizer factory at Sindri were set up to support and sustain the program of agricultural development. It was to produce... All right, um, you get the idea. So why am I showing you this? And you know, what is, uh, what is the relevance of this uh, to the, the topic of this book? So to, to get to that answer, I have to tell you sort of what I ended up concluding uh, on, on the basis of these, of these films, right? So these were, these were films that were shown in, in cinemas uh, all over the country, uh, you know, it was a compulsory uh, sort of piece of legislation that made it compulsory to, to screen these short films uh, at any point in the 50s or 60s. If you went to a cinema in India, you would see one of these uh, short films about development. Um, and, you know, when I was trying to make sense of them and I, you know, looked at a few hundred of them, what I ended up concluding was that they were basically portraying a very particular vision of the future. Uh, it was a uh, vision which had to do with emulating the sort of Western model of, of development, of um, industrial driven growth um, that the country was, was trying to pursue. But that actually wasn't something um, at all to be taken for granted. Uh, if, you, if you look at the Indian independence struggle, people like Gandhi, um, many, many within that movement actually were heavily favoring uh, rejecting the Western model of industrial development and a sort of return uh, to what they saw as, as a much more 
sort of harmonious uh, way of, of coexisting with, with nature uh, in the pre-colonial period. Uh, but this particular vision of this sort of Western modernity um, won over this, this alternative uh, vision. When you look at the demographics of the people who were uh, making these films, but also who were behind you know, those, those films in terms of the politicians that were uh, instructing uh, their, their production, they were predominantly men, uh, predominantly uh, living in, in big cities, um, educated in, in Western universities, mostly in, in Britain. Uh, tended to be people from the sort of upper upper middle class and upper caste. So a very particular demographic of people who were designing this blueprint for the future and then using this medium of uh, film to try and convince everybody else to support this particular vision. So in the book, I end up arguing that what we can learn from these films is that um, they are uh, revealing this kind of bifurcation, this kind of elitism uh, within the society between the so-called elites that are um, trying to design these, these sort of visions of the future and the so-called masses that are expected to then uh, basically follow the cue of these, of these elites and to, to fulfill and to bring about these, these visions. Um, and that's exactly what Educating for the Anthropocene is also about. That is really the common thread that, that runs through these two projects. Um, it, is, uh, it is a book which uh, doesn't look at film, it looks at education, but it argues that the education system in many ways um, fulfills the very same role that these films were fulfilling in India in the 50s and the 60s, uh, that it is essentially spreading a particular vision of the future. Uh, it is basically trying to get young people to buy into a particular blueprint for um, what the future is and, and what, it, um, what it should be. Uh, so let me before before I say anything anything more let me let me just talk about the title and the word Anthropocene, which um, I think um, a lot of people might be familiar with, but different people use it differently. So I, I just want to spend a few minutes uh, describing how how I use it. It is a word that comes from geology. Uh, it's been uh, proposed by geologists as a new geological era that uh, has replaced the Holocene. So many of us would have learned, you know, back in, in sort of secondary school science about the Holocene as the current geological period, which started when the last um, ice age uh, ended, when the glaciers melted uh, roughly 12,000 years ago. The idea is that uh, this era has now ended and we have something called the Anthropocene, which is Anthropos, related to human beings. Uh, it has to do with human influence on the, on the planet. Uh, so here you can see a sort of geological time scale and the different eras um, that have uh, unfolded over, over millions and millions of years. One of the sort of most famous uh, transitions from one era to another uh, happened about 65 million years ago when a large asteroid led to the extinction of, of roughly two thirds of all uh, animal and plant species on the planet, including famously the dinosaurs. So essentially what the Anthropocene thesis is suggesting is that we, the humans, have become the asteroid, that we have the kind of magnitude of influence over the natural environment um, that, um, that you know, previously you know, celestial bodies might have had or volcanoes might have had or tectonic plates might have had. Um, so, you know, we have we have a level of influence of, of telluric magnitude on on the planet um, we hear in the field of education a lot about education for the 21st century uh 21st century skills and and so on and one of the things that this book is is trying to do is to in some ways point to maybe just how insignificant you know the 21st century seems how it sort of pales in comparison to something like the anthropocene uh, which you know on the on the scales of, of planetary time of geological time is just so much more significant so much so much more important and yet we hear very little about uh, the anthropocene in uh, the field of, of education we tend to hear a lot more about it in in other fields in environmental humanities for example uh, so one of the things that this book is, is trying to do is to think about, you know, what are the implications of living in the Anthropocene to education? How do we educate somebody for life in the Anthropocene? How is that different from, say, education for the 21st century? Um, so let me just give you, um, well, before I, before I do that, let me just address this issue of the criticisms of uh, this, this term, uh, the Anthropocene. Uh, 
this quote that I have up, this explanation might be sufficient for polar bears or orangutans seeking to understand what species was disturbing their habitat. What is that referring to? Um, it, it has to do with a, with a criticism that uh, the Anthropocene basically throws everybody in the same category, that, that it homogenizes all people and that it assumes that we are all equally responsible for environmental degradation. Whereas we do know that, of course, that is not the case and that a lot of people are um, much more much more sort of in the category of victims than perpetrators of, of environmental destruction. Um, and that's why the, the notion of the Anthropocene has been uh, critiqued by a number of scholars as a colonial notion, uh, as, as a kind of whitewash, greenwash of, of history. Um, and there are a lot of alternatives that have been that have been put forward. Uh, there is the Anglocene, for example, uh, which derives from the fact that English speaking countries have contributed disproportionately uh, to climate change and to other um, other other ways in which the environment has been destroyed. Uh, there is the Capitalocene, which places the, the blame uh, on capitalism. Oliganthropocene, which focuses on oligarchs. There are lots and lots of lots of these different scenes that have been uh, put put forward. And I, I deal with some of them in the book's introduction, but ultimately I stick with the Anthropocene. Um, and the reason for that is I think that the Anthropocene uh, certainly has its limitations when it comes to explaining uh, how we got to this point. And I don't think it should be seen as an explanatory um, word, right? So, I mean, it might be sufficient to an orangutan or a polar bear, you know, who wanted to know what, what was disturbing their habitat, but it shouldn't, shouldn't be sufficient to, you know, to people who, who, who want to think critically about this issue. Uh, and therefore, I think, to my mind, you know, it is, it is a word whose, whose power and whose importance uh, has much more to do with the future, right? And the fact that all human beings are in this together, they are affected by this. So, you know, irrespective of how much influence we might have had on this, on this situation, we now all are um, influenced by by the fact that the situation has been created and that we have to face up to it and that we have a certain uh, responsibility, you know, in the same way that, say, people living in Nazi Germany in the 1930s uh, may not all have been equally responsible for the rise of the Nazi party, but uh, ultimately they were all there at the time that this that this happened. They were all subject to that to that condition. And I will be saying a bit more about that particular historical parallel uh, a bit a bit later on. So yes, let me give you uh, a sort of a summary of the argument. This is the only quote from the book that I'm going to share. I, I promise, uh, and it's it's quite a dense quote. So I will I will unpack it. But let me just read it first. This book then is an ethnographic exploration of schooling and activism in relationship to slow violence in the context of intergenerational legacies of colonialism, racism, and environmental degradation. What is the relevance of such an exploration to the discussion of education's role in the Anthropocene? In this ethnography, we we'll learn about the ways in which state-run schooling seeks to depoliticize the environment, co-opting environmental and sustainability education efforts in service of post-colonial and neoliberal agendas. These ethnographic accounts of schooling cast doubt on the idea that we can educate ourselves out of unsustainability so long as education means state-sponsored social reproduction. They highlight a contradiction at the heart of global environmental and sustainability education policy. We are, as the British saying goes, putting the cat among the pigeons by trusting political regimes built on environmentally unsustainable ideologies to oversee and finance the efforts to bring about sustainability through education. Such political systems have no real incentive to encourage young people to question the regime's fundamental values, such as infinite growth. This volume takes us into activist communities where such values are challenged, illustrating the ways learning for environmental justice and sustainability occurs outside formal education systems. So there's quite a lot going on here. Uh, I'm just going to pick out some of the sort of basic basic points to, to give you a sense of, of the argument. So first of all, it's an ethnography, which means that it is um, it is a story, essentially. It's a story that has characters and, and places, uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about those places and those characters um, in, a, in a minute. So there is a sort of strong theoretical aspect to the book, but it is very much grounded in the experience of, of everyday people. Uh, it takes place in two particular places, um, in India and in um, South Africa. The, the Indian research site is called Pashulok. Uh, it is a rehabilitation site for some of the people who were moved by the sort of forcibly displaced by the Indian government uh, when a large dam that displaced about 100,000 people was, was built. Uh, the site in uh, South Africa is in South Durban, which is one of the places that has the highest levels of air pollution on Earth. Uh, 
Uh, it is a place that some historians actually argues uh, could be the sort of origin of apartheid in, in, in some ways, because um, what, what's happened in, in South Durban is that a very large port was, was built here, and to this day it remains the largest uh, port in all of Africa. Uh, and around this port, there were a lot of industries that were that were built, uh, and especially in the sort of late 19th, early 20th century, uh, these industries needed labor, and that labor, uh, you know, couldn't really come from, uh, you know, the sort of white South Africans because because they would not be willing to, uh, you know, to work in these really sort of dreadful conditions, you know, highly kind of uh, polluting um, conditions, and so the government goes ahead and, and basically creates a sort of zoning policy. Um, where it again forcibly moves people to the vicinity of these industries, creating a sort of pool of, of essentially disposable labor of people of color uh, who are then basically you know, forced to work in these, in these industries um, and of course are you know, suffering terribly as a result. Uh, and this is something that in, in one form or another persists um, to, to this day. Um, in the school where I, where I did my field work in South Durban, uh, the uh, the sort of rate of of asthma uh, among the students was something like fifty five percent, which if you just go a few miles north, kind of over the hill to to North Durban, you know the same the same city, uh, drops down to about five percent, and that's just that's just one particular health condition. There are also you know thyroid cancers and and other other uh, ways in which people here are are affected. Uh, so you've got this long legacy of, of environmental of environmental racism uh, that, uh, as I was saying, you know, some some argue actually created a kind of blueprint for uh, apartheid city planning and and the kind of segregation of of uh, white people and people of color. Um, so you know why why go to places like this, right? Why do it an ethnography uh, in uh, in places like this uh, about education for the Anthropocene, and, and what can that tell us about? The kind of general idea of education for the Anthropocene. So what I what I argue in this book is that these are spaces of what I call the high Anthropocene, uh, right? So the Anthropocene is what we all live in, but then uh, I'm arguing that there is something called the high Anthropocene, uh, which is where the Anthropocene really accelerates. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this expression slow violence, which is also in the subtitle of the of the book. Um, that is a, a wonderful book, you know, called Slow Violence that I would recommend to anybody uh, reading this uh, or interested in this in this topic written by Rob Nixon, who's uh, actually at, at Harvard, uh, environmental humanities scholar. Um, and his argument is that um, and much of environmental degradation is in the form of slow violence. So it is violent, but it is slow in the sense that we cannot observe it in real time. We cannot perceive it, see it with our senses. Uh, and that makes it particularly difficult for educators. How do you how do you educate somebody about something that they cannot see, that they cannot sort of um, you know viscerally experience through through their own senses, as opposed to the fast violence, right? That, that is the kind of violence that we see in everyday news, which we can easily capture with cameras, you know, with and understand and see through our through our senses. Um, so what I argue is that these spaces of the high Anthropocene are the spaces where slow violence accelerates, that these are the spaces where slow violence becomes, uh, becomes visible. It turns into fast violence. If, uh, you know, if your house is flooded by a dam and you're forced to relocate, or uh, if your lungs are being eaten up by um, toxic smoke, you know, these are forms of fast violence. So in some ways, uh, I, I think of, of these research sites a little bit like a time machine, right? That these are places that um, in some ways are places of the future uh, that, uh, you know, maybe some of us who are privileged enough to live in communities that are not affected quite quite so much just yet uh, are not experiencing environmental decay on this, on this level, on this scale. Um, but by going to these places and, and studying what goes on there educationally, both inside the schools and outside of the schools, you know, for the reasons that this quote articulates, that there are inherent limitations uh, to schooling and the extent to which schooling can challenge the, the status quo and the kind of political structures of which it is a part, um, that there's, there's a great value for doing that for understanding this, this idea of education for the Anthropocene uh, more, more globally, uh, because it, it gives us this kind of a glimpse into, into the future. 
Okay, so let me just tell you a bit more about about these places. Uh, what you're looking at here is is Tehri Dam, which is which is the dam that I was that I was talking about, which displaced uh, the people uh, with whom I was I was doing this this research in in India. Uh, this is what the rehabilitation site looks like in in Pashulok. It is a place that um, has actually been uh you know where, where these these refugees these austies were essentially uh, abandoned by the government you know the government didn't build uh any infrastructure any streets uh you know this is an abandoned shopping center sort of shopping complex uh where the school where i was doing my field work is squatting on the second floor so you know no no school was built or provided by the by the government so you know apart from the environmental angle there's also a definite um, social justice and environmental justice angle here as as well, uh, and this this condition uh, of of you know these these uh, sort of multi layered injustices has given rise to um, a, a sort of activist a very very sort of strong activist presence in the in the area, um, you know where you've got uh, lots of people not just challenging the the wisdom of building large dams and displacing hundreds of thousands of people to build these dams. But also the larger um, idea of the kind of development and the kind of future that these dams represent. You know, if you go back to that short film that I was showing in the beginning, you know, that particular vision of the future, which goes all the way back to the colonial uh, period, and you know, this idea of kind of emulating, replicating the the Western uh, development trajectory. Uh, this is a view from the school corridor in in South Durban. So you know you can see the the smokestacks of the of the oil refinery in the background, just just a stone's throw away from uh, from the school. Uh, you know the residential area does come up all the way to the fence line of the of the oil refinery. Uh, so you know this this you, you really can see this this history when you when you walk these streets and you can you can really you can really see how this segregation uh, you know uh, originated originated here. Um, so you know this really is is a very very sort of troubled uh, area in in many in many many ways, and you know when I when I got to these places, uh, I sort of had to ask myself you know how do I actually go about uh, looking at something like education for the Anthropocene uh, here you know how do I how do I try to access people's imaginations of the future and how do I understand how they're learning and making sense of this condition of being of you know what, what I call uh, the frontier of the high the high Anthropocene. Um, I used a lot of visual uh, methods borrowed from from visual anthropology uh, to to do this and, and one of these methods was um, working with children with young people uh, asking them to draw pictures of imagined futures and imagined pasts imagined sort of past past worlds. Uh, so here is uh, what the imagined future of a 12 year old boy in, in South Durban looks like, which um, I, I don't think needs much of a much of a commentary. Uh, here is another one also also from South Durban. And, you know, when you look at the, the pictures of, of how these children imagined the, the past to be, uh, you know, what, what life was like 100 years ago. Uh, there are much happier pictures, you know, you, you see a lot more natural elements in the landscape, you, you see human beings sort of being much closer to these natural elements. Uh, you know, these, these seem, seem sort of more, more optimistic, you could say. So, you know, if I sort of stopped the research at this, at this point, and I, I just sort of took this away, you know, I, I guess I could make the argument, you know, that, that what these kids are doing is uh, essentially what those of us in the field of anthropology are doing you know we are despairing about the future and we are romanticizing the past um but um thankfully the beauty of ethnography and, and spending a lot of time in a place and, and really immersing yourself in that in that place uh means that you you know you get to engage a bit more deeply with uh, with people's ideas and the the way i did that in, in this project uh was through participatory filmmaking uh which is a technique that was pioneered by the australian uh, visual ethnographer um, uh, uh, McDougall, David McDougall, uh, who basically believes that it is very difficult to have a dialogue between generations, you know, that something gets lost uh, when we speak uh, with young people, you know, that we as adults may not be able to fully understand what they're trying to tell us, and we need these other mediums, these other ways of communicating uh, to, to really sort of uh, grasp, you know, what they're trying to tell us. Uh, so he came up with this idea of observational filmmaking, which uh, I adopted for this for this project, uh, modified modified slightly. Um, it involved uh, a two month um, workshop uh, where 
uh, I would teach children how to use professional professional grade camera equipment, and the professional grade uh, equipment is quite important uh, in this in this context, which I suppose makes this method you know, a little bit quirky and, and unusual. Uh, a lot of these visual methods that that other scholars use tend to rely on uh, cell phones or disposable cameras or uh, you know relatively sort of cheap equipment. Um, the point of using professional grade gear is that. It uh, first of all creates an opportunity uh, for the researcher to to come together with the researched in some kind of a joint project. You know, it takes quite a lot of time to teach somebody how to how to use this equipment. Uh, you have to teach them a lot of different concepts as well. You know, around white balance, focal length, uh, focus, zoom. You know, all of these all of these different decisions that they have to make anytime they press the record button. Uh, so you're, you're creating this space, you know, where you're building trust, you're getting to know them, you know, you're having conversations without actually getting into the topic of, uh, you know, what they're going to be working on. So in, in a way, you, you know, it's sort of quote unquote, un, more neutral uh, way of, of, of trying to trying to build a relationship with a research participant where you don't get into these questions you really want to ask them, but you just you just to talk to them about these, you know, technical skills. Um, and it also uh, forces the children themselves just to sort of really pay attention to what they're doing, right? They, you know, anytime, anytime they're they're having to sort of press that record button, they have made a number of choices. They have thought very carefully about how to set up each shot, uh, and so this, you know, really makes it um, it really slows down their gaze, you know. And I think if we are dealing with slow violence, you know, we need methods even accelerating slow violence, right? We need methods that are commensurate with that slowness. So we need slow methods. We need methods that really force us to sort of, you know, slow down, think, reflect, uh, and be very intentional. So I think that's that's what this method, that's what this method does. And um, I did this uh, with the young people in, in both places uh to basically see you know see what they see what they do you know uh, after the workshop they take the cameras home they keep them home for a few months they keep filming and they keep putting together these these films and what was very interesting uh to me was how they went about doing this uh, so this is a still from one of the films that was that was done in in the indian side um where the the kids basically uh spent all their time talking to older people these these activists you know these people who were um, uh, very much in touch with what life was like before the dam was built, before these villages were submerged. Um, and the beauty of these films is that not only you, you, you get a sort of rich source of data through these films themselves, but they also become starting points for conversations, you know, where, uh, you know, once the children have made these films, you can ask them all kinds of questions about the choices that they've made. And um, when I ask them about, you know, why they chose to talk to older people as opposed to their peers or people closer to their age, the answer was that they were aware of this activist presence in the community and that they uh, very much wanted to learn more about what these activists were doing. Uh, and, you know, it was very clear that on some level that activist presence uh, was shaping their imagination of the of the future. And they tried to also use this, this research project as an opportunity to get closer to that sort of activist imaginary, uh, which is also what happened in, in the South African side. And I must say, this was a, this was a bit sort of nerve wracking for me as a as a researcher because you know these kids sort of had you know free reign over what they were going to film. They could have filmed anything, and it could have had zero relevance to my research questions. Uh, so it was a bit of a gamble in a way uh, to to do this. But I suppose my assumption was that you know if my hypothesis is correct, you know that this is the high Anthropocene, and and there are these activist uh, movements that are present in these communities that is somehow going to play into how young people think about the future. And there will be some kind of activist education that is going on uh, through their presence. Um, this is Desmond Desa, who is uh, one of the most prominent uh, environmental activists in, in South Africa, quite quite famous sort of internationally for his activism. He's holding a device uh, for measuring air quality. And again, you know, this is a still from one of the films that the students made where they, they went to talk to him and ask him questions about um, the sort of constitutionally guaranteed uh, right to a clean environment that is is anchored in the South African constitution and how they can how they can sort of enforce it and and he talks to them about how they can do that and how he does that with the help of his activist um, colleagues so this this sort of activist um, exposure and the role that the activists played in the imaginations of these young people uh, really sort of led me to this to this question of, of how activist uh, counter narratives of change might shape a reimagination of the of the future. Uh, 
Um, and this is, you know, where it gets a little bit uh, theoretical, um, but I also am aware that I don't have too much time left. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to cover this, but, you know, I'll do it quickly. And if you have questions about it, I can, I can come back to it later. Um, so in the, in the book, I argue that uh, what the activists do in both cases, in, in the Indian and the South African case, is what Chantal Mouffe, the, the political scientist, has called agonistic pluralism. Uh, Mouffe makes a distinction between deliberative democracy and agonistic pluralism, where deliberative democracy is basically the system that we live in, which is heavily institutionalized, where we have these institutions in place that are um, designed to uh, reach what move calls a rational consensus. So we, uh, you know, we have differences, we have different views and ideas about the world. We put these through the institutions and the institutions help us reach this so-called rational consensus. Move argues that what the institutions end up doing is um, they end up actually sanitizing this conversation, sanitizing the discourse to the point that they remove the very stuff of politics, right? By trying to make this whole exchange so very civil, through these institutional setups, we end up kind of removing our very subjectivities and those uh, essential differences actually get erased, right? And, and the dialogue that, that results through uh, deliberate democracy ends up being really devoid of conflict and tension. Um, so what MOVE argues we need to do instead is agonistic pluralism. That is where we really embrace our differences. We embrace our subjectivities. And we sort of really try to, to locate our politics in that kind of productive space of tension. Um, you know, it's not the same as, as anarchy. You know, Muf is not talking about uh, abandoning democracy. Uh, she's, she's merely saying that we need, to, we need to find other ways within a democratic setup to have this dialogue. Uh, and, you know, part of that is to still recognize that the person who disagrees with me is not an enemy to be destroyed. It is rather um, an intellectual opponent Right, so we, you know, we both have a commitment to an underlying idea of democracy, um, but within that underlying idea, we are willing to go into confrontation. We are willing to really expose who we are politically uh, in a way that institutions may not allow us to do through deliberative um, democracy. So I argue that these these activists do this in their in their practice as as activists. And I link this to the work of Hannah Arendt, who is really the sort of central uh, theoretical figure in the in the book that I argue. Uh, you know, has been perhaps a little bit overlooked, you know, when it comes to the topic of the environment. She's, you know, particularly known for her work on the origins of um, totalitarianism. Uh, but I think a lot of her thought actually is very, very much applicable to uh, this, this question of, of uh, environmental destruction in the, in the Anthropocene. Um, you know, Arendt um, was interested in, in what enabled the, the kind of violence of concentration camps and, and gulags of the sort of 21st uh, of the 20th century uh, totalitarian regimes. Uh, and she came up with this idea of bureaucratization, uh, which is basically the idea that we lose sight of um, the kind of larger moral uh, orientation of what the systems that we are a part of enable. Um, so, you know, I don't know about you, but you know, when I when I wake up in the morning, I, I don't sort of decide to actively go out into the world and, and destroy the environment, right? It's it's not a sort of intentional choice that I make. And yet, just by living in the current socioeconomic system, that is the very sort of outcome towards which I am contributing with a lot of the things that I do in the world. And that is true of, of, of many of us. Um, in, in the same way, you know, that people who uh Hannah Arendt was studying, you know, people in, in Nazi Germany, for example, in the 1930s may not have woken up in the morning deciding to send others into a gas chamber, and yet they were part of a system that was enabling just that outcome. So there's something about bureaucratization and the way that it enabled fast violence in the 20th century, and the way that that very process of bureaucratization might be enabling the slow violence of the Anthropocene. Um, and so I was very interested in, 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 this, in this link and this, this parallel. Uh, and, you know, Arendt also talks about um, agonistic pluralism, and, and she sees agonistic pluralism as the prerequisite for action, which is the antidote to bureaucratization. So I have just simplified a lot of very um, uh, sort of tricky theoretical ground, but that's the kind of basic theoretical argument that, um, that uh, Arendt makes and that I think applies to this question of educating for the Anthropocene and where the activist imaginaries and practices of agonistic pluralism as opposed to deliberative democracy 
come in. Okay, so let's just bring this all together. Uh, you know, what does um, what does the book really talk about? It talks about building bridges between activists and educators, which means recognizing that spaces of schooling are not the same as spaces of education, that there is education that goes on outside of the walls of the schools, and that a lot of the things that are currently happening internationally in the field of education actually are going in the opposite direction from what the research in this book calls for in, in terms of what would be what would be appropriate for the Anthropocene, rather than globalizing curricula, localization of curricula is, is what is needed, rather than um, turning teachers into simple deliverers of cur curriculum and essentially bureaucratizing them, we need to actually be upskilling them and thinking of them as political agents uh, that are able to model the kind of democratic engagement that um, we might see among some of these, some of these uh, communities. Um, and I think also we maybe need to think about removing some of the barriers between activism and uh, and education that currently that currently exist. So educating for the Anthropocene in in short means recognizing of the Anthropocene and its implications as the historical moment we will live in, which means thinking about deep geological time, planetary boundaries, and stewardship of the planet. It means returning to a definition of sustainability that um, really places the environmental as opposed to the economic or the social at its at its center. And these ideas of historical responsibility, political imagination, and, and action that we see in these in these activist communities. Um, and finally, um, I would like to just just share with you this visualization, uh, which uh, Nuit Morales, who I believe might actually be here today, uh, who is a very talented uh, designer and a very good friend of mine. Uh, and, and I, we sort of sat together and we and we thought about how might we take the basic idea of the book and. Uh, share it with non-academics, teachers, educators, you know, people who don't necessarily want to read the whole monograph and, you know, deal with the ideas of Hannah Arendt and Chantal Mouffe. And we came up with these four, um, these four words um, to kind of summarize what this, what this might look like. Grasp, care, imagine, and communicate. Grasping what is at stake, um, caring, so an emotional response, as opposed to a lot of the kind of more intellectual, cognitive um, aspects of education that we currently focus on. Uh, really recognizing that there is an emotional response when it comes to understanding environmental decay, imagination of alternative futures, and the ability to communicate that imagination to other people. Uh, and you know, as we know from the work of Hannah Arendt, political action is is never possible in isolation. It always emerges from the engagement and the intersubjective space between between uh, different people. So we really need others to come together. Uh, to communicate these these visions in order for action, which is the antidote to bureaucratization, as I was saying earlier, uh, to to emerge. Um, so this is sort of one way of articulating what uh, educating for the Anthropocene could look like. There are other ways to think about it, um, but uh, maybe one last thing that I would say about this this model or this idea is that in many ways this is nothing new. This is this is nothing sort of. There's no sort of new fancy theory that we are proposing. It is it is simply just thinking about the things that already make us human, right? The elements of being human. When when a child is born, it grasps, right? It's very natural to grasp things. It is very natural to care, imagine, and to communicate. These are all very human human things. So there's something about education simply just helping us unlock the potential of of these things that we already possess. Uh, rather than uh, you know trying to trying to or maybe getting out of the way you know uh, and not creating barriers to them rather than trying to sort of create something on top of this that is much more complicated and artificial. Okay, I will I will leave it there and I'd be happy to take any questions. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Yes, we do have a couple of questions here. Um, how does it change the process that the children will not be able to rewatch the film they made after you leave? Uh, well, they are, they are. I mean, uh, so what happens is um, they, and this is one of the difference between the the way that David McDougall, who originally pioneered this this method, and the way that I uh, then tried to adopt it, was was that with McDougall, he would actually take the footage away and do the editing himself, and then he would sort of send the finished films back for children to watch. Uh, in my case, what I ended up doing because I had a bit more time was to actually uh, teach teach the kids to use um, video editing software and uh, to actually do the editing themselves. So they edited them themselves, and they um, you know and they have access to them. You know, they I, I left copies with them. Uh, they actually decided to upload it on YouTube as well because they wanted to share it with their families and friends. Uh, so yeah, it's it's all available. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, what barriers between activism and schooling do you see as most prominent and how might we co combat these barriers? Ooh, right, okay. Uh, that, that question would deserve a lecture of its own. I mean, you know, but just based on this research, uh, and obviously these are particular national contexts, um, but um, I certainly picked up on a lot of skepticism, both among educators about activists and among activists about educators, where, you know, activists see educators as um, sort of the enemy, you know, part of part of the state, the evil state, you know, that is that is hijacking the future. Uh, and then the educators, you know, see activists as these sort of crazy anti-systemic elements, uh, you know, that are that are dangerous and that kids should not be exposed to. And I think when you talk to both of these camps of people, you very quickly discover that these are caricatures and that, uh, you know, a lot of the activists, for example, that I that I worked with uh, during this research uh, were simply just calling for um, things, you know, that were already written in the constitution of these countries to simply just be implemented, uh, you know, in a, in a meaningful way rather than, than just in a sort of pro forma way. So I think, um, you know, the first step I would say is to work on these perceptions, uh, you know, and to, to really, to really try and, uh, see that these are not polar opposites. These are not binaries. And in fact, uh, there's a, there's a section in the book called outlier teachers, uh, where I look at teachers who actually think of themselves as activists uh, and, you know, also maybe recognizing that there is such a thing as being an educational activist or an activist educator, that there are hybrid identities that um, can be um, not only recognized, but also maybe encouraged through, say, teacher training, uh, you know, uh, programs that that may be currently don't incorporate i mean if certainly any teacher training program that i've i've seen doesn't doesn't really um sort of present this idea that maybe it maybe being a teacher is actually a form of activism right because it has something to do with reshaping the future so um yeah so i think it, it's got something to do with changing perceptions recognizing hybrid identities um and uh, yeah and building these bridges thank you um, in the spirit of activism, what do you think we can do with the information we've learned today that will help us help us move forward? Okay, um, yeah, I mean, it depends, I suppose, you know, who you are and, and, and what you do. Uh, you know, we all have different um, tools, you know, different opportunities to, to create change in the world. Um, I mean, on a, on a very basic level, I think, you know, if you are somebody who is interested in, in education, you know, uh, think about, you know, what your impact on education is right now, or maybe in the future, and how, you know, you might be able to, to take these ideas and um, do something with them, right? So, for example, if you are a policymaker, uh, maybe you can, you can think about the kinds of policies that would be more conducive to, say, teacher autonomy, uh, in, in the way that allows them, you know, to be to be more activist. If you are a teacher yourself, maybe you can think about what kind of autonomy you already have, uh, you know, I, I was very struck by uh, these these outlier teachers and, and just how smart they are at, at navigating and kind of working the system, you know, where uh, there was you know, there was a whole sort of conversation that I had, which is sort of summarized in, in a very short paragraph in the book. But, you know, with, with the teacher who in, in South Africa, who was talking about uh, what she called the hidden curriculum that she tries to teach to, to her students and what she called the hidden activist curriculum. Um, and just just you know the amount of thinking and and um, intentionality you know that that went into designing that curriculum and delivering it in such a way that that teacher didn't get fired, in a, in a system that actually is very oppressive, uh, to me was just stunning you know and, and very very inspiring. So you know again you know it's going to be different for different people, but thinking about you know what is my sphere of influence and what can I do in that sphere um, that is going to shift the needle in in the right direction because as I was saying earlier I think currently. The direction of travel um, when it comes to sort of mainstream uh, education discourse, I think, is away from education for the Anthropocene rather than towards it. Great, thank you. Um, this is an interesting one. The graphic is lovely, but wouldn't it be better to make the two figures distinctively different, i.e. acknowledging that the communication needs to be respectfully, to respectfully engage uh, variously different people? 
Yeah, no, uh, that is a very good point. And I think we, yeah, I, I don't know if Nuit is still here, but maybe we should take that on board. I mean, just to give you a little bit of, of, of context and to be entirely transparent, um, this second graphic actually doesn't appear in the book. Uh, it was something that somebody pointed out to me that, you know, we need to build action into this model. And um, uh, so Nuit and I, you know, the designer who was helped me with this were just uh, sitting together a couple of weeks ago and, and we just sat down and we very quickly tried to sort of thrash out a version of this graphic that would have two people in it. So we just basically copy pasted the figure. Um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, it would make more sense to, to, to show that difference because yeah, that is, that is part of the, um, uh, that, that is part of what Hannah Arendt also, I think would argue that, um, you know, if we were all just copies of one another, then you know that kind of intersubjective engagement wouldn't lead to action, right? The action emerges out of that tension between differences. So we need that difference. And yeah, so I, I would agree that it would be good to, to also make that clear in the in the graphic. Great, thank you. Um, we probably have time for maybe another question or two. Um, most conversation about most conversations about climate education come from scientists and science educator educators. Their contribution is, of course, essential, but also tends to focus on teaching what climate change is rather than how to take climate action. Do you have any suggestions for how we can bring education for understanding climate change and education for climate action into one more collaborative and interdisciplinary conversation? Okay, so I mean, with that question, I'm I'm going to sort of I'm not sure I'll be answering it directly because I think there are a couple of things in that question that um, I, I would I would want to say a bit bit about it. One one is the idea of climate action or or climate education. So in in the book, I, I quite consciously actually avoid uh, the language of of climate uh, because I think the one of the really uh, interesting things about the the Anthropocene is that you know it. it sort of brings our attention to the fact that climate change is just one of a number of issues that are that are going on right i mean uh the the fact that we have um you know turned turned nature into an object uh, that we have commodified nature and that uh, we basically just see it as as a means to an end uh you know has all kinds of other implications and so i i use uh, an expression that i borrow from from karen litvin um, the environmental multi-crisis, uh, you know, which sounds very depressing, but I think it is, it is, it is necessary to to keep that kind of nuance in this conversation because I think the moment we just focus on climate change, you know, it, it becomes very easy to sort of slide into thinking of this as an engineering problem and thinking of just you know replacing dirty technologies with the so-called clean technologies, rather than thinking about the more fundamental um, issues of extractivism of the kind of cultural, political, social. Um, engagement with nature. Uh, so I think uh, that, that would be the first thing I would say. Uh, the, the other uh, thing I would say is, you know, in, in some ways, this book doesn't actually suggest, you know, that, that schools should be, um, you know, creating activists or that they should be somehow, you know, trying to, trying to make people behave in a certain way. Um, uh, just just going back to, to the basics, right, and the idea that uh, we already have all the tools that we need to reimagine the future as as humans, and that we just need to maybe get in touch with them and be connected with them. Um, you know, to, to my mind, that means education for the sake of education, right, as opposed to education for the sake of climate action or for the sake of climate change or for the sake of anything, right? I think the moment we instrumentalize education and we turn it into a means to an end, um, you know, we we risk you know, uh, sort of getting further away from these basics. Um, and I think, you know, if we stick with the basics and if we help people get in touch with their own humanity, with their own imaginations of the alternative futures, with their ability to feel an emotional response when it comes to uh, environmental decay, to communicate that imagination and that response to others, to act together, I think that's that's when we increase the likelihood that that climate action or Anthropocene action or whatever we want to call it, uh, occurs. Uh, so, so I, I actually call this in my work the the, the uh, um, despair paradox. That you know, if we are desperate for that outcome, we are less likely to achieve it than if we just let the education sort of take a take its own form, take its own shape. Uh, and that is that is one of the things I, I learned from from the activists as as well. Thank you. 
Peter, I just want to say this has been fantastic. I am skimming through the questions, just um, eating them up. I mean, they're, people are very, very inspired by this work. And it's so incredibly um, well done. I mean, well researched. It's an example also of certainly ethnography, but really bringing student voices or, you know, voices of all people into this. Um, into these problems. And I think one of the things that, you know, struck me, one of the many, I've been taking notes, um, that you said was to be isolated is to be deprived of the capacity to act. And I think one of the things that you did, getting back to kind of our early conversations about interventions, is that by giving the, the professional tools to the kids, you actually brought them together out of isolation and you empowered them to act. So we've been talking a lot about teachers and actually you, you often use the word educator, not teacher, but the, the kids are educators too. And I think that that's a really important piece of this project that I just hope that people also take away um, from your talk. But most of all, thank you so much for bringing this excellent work to us all. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I know there are more questions. So if, if anybody feels very strongly about their question, do feel free to email me. I'll, I'll do my best to get back to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for this uh, very important uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, Monica. And uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I, I hope we'll see all of you again next year for um, spring lineup. Thanks.